So I'm starting to get some uh, questions through the chat. So I, that's probably the best way. Um, I see one raised hand, but I've got, we'll start with a question, I think primarily for you, um, Kenza. It's uh, about the status of juvenile, juvenile detention centers and all of this. Have there been any confirmed cases or tests conducted for incarcerated youth? Um, yes, so because of um, the advocacy of the ACLU and others in this coalition, um, the Department of Youth Services um, and the Department of Rehabilitation and Corrections started releasing daily um, updates on what tests um, they've been doing inside their facilities. Um, however, uh, as of yesterday, they still have only tested one young person in their facilities and that one test came back negative. Um, there have been, I believe, a handful of um, providers, like adult providers, staff who work in the facilities across the state um, who have been tested, um, but there is almost no testing um, across the state. And because of the data disparity in the 88 counties, we don't know what's happening in many of the juvenile detention centers and many of the local juvenile detention centers across the state. Um, so I think uh, there is a major problem um, in not testing um, and not uh, publishing whether children have any symptoms. Okay, um, anybody else want to add anything to Kenza's response there? Okay. We have another question um, from Andrew Welsh Huggins. Um, is there a state whose approach to inmate release right now that you'd like Ohio to, to emulate? We've already mentioned Pennsylvania, which definitely was a, a pretty strong step in the right direction. Although, I mean, 1800 is in Ohio would be a really good step in the right direction, but not enough from our perspective, but it's certainly that broader approach uh, releasing a broad category without as many conditions as Governor DeWine has put on his more limited release. So I would uh, highlight that. Um, I could probably put in the chat a link to a story about that. Um, anybody else on the panel want to answer that question? Uh, yeah, Pete, um, uh, you know, forgive me, uh, Andrew, I haven't had a chance to catch up totally on what other states have been doing in this regard over the weekend, only because as you might expect for the ACLU of Ohio, we're in sort of been triage mode for the past month trying to deal with these issues. Uh, but what I have seen, the, the headlines uh, over the weekend were states uh, talking about uh, releasing uh, in the thousands uh, with regard to their states. Um, I've had an opportunity to look at what some national corrections experts via our national office that have been able to facilitate have been saying about what would be necessary. And the baseline recommendation appears to be you need to get your prison facility or at least each of those individual facilities within the prison system, I should say, uh, down to the point where they are able to single bunk uh, or single cell, I should say. Uh, what that number would be in Ohio, I'm not sure, but you might very well be talking about decarcerating our prison population by half or near half. Policy cons or practical considerations aside, political considerations aside, if you just want to simply know what would uh, uh, get us a long way towards dealing with COVID-19 in the prison system, again, you're talking about thousands upon thousands of people at this point. Okay, thank you, Gary. Um, Jenna Cisneros has a question. I think I can unmute you, unmute you, Jenna, to ask your question directly. You should be unmuted, Jenna. Hey guys, can you hear me? Very faintly. Sorry, I'm using my laptop. I put it in the I can chat. Also re yes. So, so you go ahead if you want to ask yeah, your question. Obviously, the other side of this story um, are the victims and family of victims who don't want offenders out. What would be your guys's message to those people, and how could you ensure their safety, given that they come out? So I, I would have two reactions to that. This is Carter Stewart. One, as was mentioned in the beginning of this conference, we're we're not advocating for anybody and everybody to be released. There, I, I personally think there should be. Uh, a careful screening of folks who may pose a danger uh, if they were released. So that they're, so we do want to protect in that sense. The other thing I would say is when there's a victim involved in criminal activity, 
the vast majority of the time that victim is in the same person's community. And what we're, we're saying is if you keep people in the prisons, you are putting everybody at risk if, if they get infected with the virus and then are released back to the community where the victims are. So in some respects, this is protecting the victims from the effects of, of the virus uh, themselves. Kevin, did you want to? You're muted, Kevin. Am I unmuted? There we go. Thank you. Um, so to answer that question, uh, as I mentioned earlier, that everybody who we're asking for the release of has been identified as nonviolent. And to define that, that's different than somebody who was essentially convicted of a violent crime to um, being identified by the uh, DRC system as low risk for recidivizing and, um, and somebody who has proven to show uh, good conduct in the institution. So um, the, these people, uh, you know, I just plead with all respect to, to uh, victims that, that, you know, the people we're asking to come home have shown that they are ready and have rehabilitated um, themselves and they're ready to come home. I think that's also important to think about. I mean, often what, where we end up is like thinking about nonviolent people um, who are incarcerated and they should be the priority, but I, our focus is really on broader categories, looking at people who are for recidivism, like you said, contracting the disease. I think Kev, to uh, Kevin's point, you know, being rehabilitated and having been however long you've, when somebody has been in prison, you know, the violent, nonviolent thing puts up sort of a false dichotomy of what's, who is ready and who is rehabilitated and, and who should be released in this moment. Um, and I, I, for me, I think for a lot of this comes down to what people have already said, you know, a prison sentence should not be a death sentence, especially for people who are closer to closer to release already, closer to opportunities for release, and um, with some of these underlying conditions. So that's I think important point. Um, so I will um, the night we raised hand badly. I will try to allow you to ask your question. You're muted, Bennett. Thanks so much. Uh, this is thanks so much. I appreciate it. This is Bennett Haverly with uh, Ten TV WBNS. Um, I, this is a question to anybody who's able to answer. Uh, logistically, what would your plan be for the release of these inmates, uh, given the probability now that many of them could have been exposed to COVID nineteen, um, and given the backdrop that we know a lot of parole officers are are overwhelmed right now and, and DRC releases a lot of people into homelessness. I'll take a shot at that. Um, the ACLU uh, nationally and the ACLU of Ohio haven't endorsed anything specifically at this point. Uh, but what you very well might be talking about with a mass release of people from prison is first and foremost the idea that uh, uh, some or all of them, because I think we should assume at this point that everybody who is in it, that every prison facility has been exposed to COVID-19. Uh, but you might be talking about an intermediate period of, of uh, uh, um, uh, somewhere where they can be safe, quarantined um, for two or three weeks uh, before they re-enter regular society so that they and everybody else are kept safe. What is quite clear is that DRC, the Department of Health, the governor, uh, everybody else involved uh, is hopefully thinking about these things for the past several weeks uh, because uh, we're getting too late to start thinking about how that might be accomplished right now. Uh, what is crystal clear right now is that having this many people in prison, 10,000 above capacity, is not an option. And COVID-19 is something that is unprecedented in our lifetimes, and I hope it remains so once we get over this hump. 
Uh, but, but the option right now, plan A, leaving this many people in prison uh, is not an option. And so again, we're gonna have to think creatively. We're gonna have to think flexibly about how we handle this many people coming out. And re-entry is obviously a big part of that. Nobody should think that we're not concerned about that issue as well. Uh, but we're going to need to put our heads together to deal with this. And again, part of that might be quarantining uh, large numbers of people for, for a very temporary amount of time. Yeah, thank you, Gary. I would also add, you know, Policy Matters hasn't, you know, come up with a set of recommendations specifically to this issue, but there is an interesting document out of Indiana recently about their recommendations for, recommendations for an approach. And I'll try to look for that link and with the group. Um, again, it's not a recommendation, but they're taking a very interesting approach to how you would deal with um, overwhelmed pro officers and how you might house people in the interim for quarantine um, if they don't have a place to go. So um, I think there are some, that's one example from another state that might be of interest for the people on the call. Um, we have a question from Sarah Volpenine. Um, what do you know about what kind of medical care is available to prison inmates with COVID-19 at the prisons, particularly at Marion? How equipped are the prisons for treating people with COVID-19 specifically? Um, I'll answer this question just because I was at Marion. So the prisons are not equipped to handle uh, a situation like this. I know that the people that are diagnosed with COVID-19 are just thrown into the hole, into segregation, um, where essentially there is no treatment, but just time to, to sweat it out, I guess. Uh, so really, you know, the, the institution is, is not equipped. Um, I don't know. Um, uh, I guess that, yeah, I mean, the, the, I hope that answers your question. Okay. Um, I am going to unmute Don Wolf, who has a question. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, yeah, I couldn't find my uh, camera. I think my cat made off with it. Um, the joys of working from home. Um, I'm not in Ohio. Um, I'm in Michigan. So some of this is very, I know will be very 101 in background for you, but um, where do the figures of the, that 10,000 over capacity come from? What study was done or how, how did that come together? And what trends have led to this situation? It seems like in Ohio incarcerates an awful lot of people that might not necessarily be incarcerated or for the same length of time in other states. So how did you come up with that figure and why are so many people are in, are, are so many people in, in Ohio prisons? Um, I'll take a quick crack at that and I'm gonna apologize because I have to jump off for another call uh, uh, and I'm gonna jump back on this one if there are still questions after I take care of that one, but very quickly. Um, those figures about a prison population come directly from the prison system itself. Uh, they used to report, they don't anymore, but they used to report on a monthly basis uh, that their capacity is right around 38,000 people. We know that the current prison population is 49,000 people. So we have about 11,000 above capacity right now. And the reason that is, there's a variety of reasons, but a big reason is because Ohio legislators keep introducing and passing new laws, numerous laws every single year, year after year, to put more people in prison and put them behind bars for a longer period of time. Ohio's prisons have been overcrowded since I started with the ACLU of in 1995, and they have been uh, 10,000 over capacity for at least the last 10 years. So this is not new here in Ohio that we are far above capacity, uh, but the legislature and the governors, multiple governors up to this point, uh, have not done anything to relieve that capacity uh, in a meaningful way. And so uh, we are always trying to uh, uh, reduce our prison population under non-COVID-19 circumstances. Uh, right now, of course, it is uh, that much more important. Yeah, and um, I think other people have had questions along these lines about how many, you know, how many people would need to be released. And you know, Gary, you've addressed that to some degree. I think it's also worth mentioning some other 
information about that, you know, it's about 20% of people incarcerated in state prisons right now are there for violations of their conditions of release. Many of them, most, for the most part, um, violations are not in, of themselves crimes. Um, also, a lot of uh, people who are in prison for low level drug offenses. Um, and as, as we've talked about before, you know, this sort of the failed approach to uh, drug addiction and drug use has been about um, really, um, you know, incarcerating more people as opposed to providing treatment. And even before COVID-19 um, started happening here, we um, had been advocating as a group and doing research around what it would look like to release people for lower level or not incarcerate people for lower level drug offenses and instead to focus on treatment and different ways to, uh, to help them as opposed to just incarcerating them. Um, issue one was an, was an attempt at that um, and uh, that did not pass. Currently in the legislature, Senate Bill 3 is a, looks at reclassifying um, drug use offenses um, to keep people out of prison in the first place. And that's certainly something that is still, we hope, it's been work, the legislature has introduced it to their credit um, there's a lot of support for it in legislature and it has not moved quickly, unfortunately. It was introduced more than a year ago. Also House Bill 1, um, which provides more opportunities for treatment in lieu of conviction. That is also a very positive step in the right direction. But again, neither of those bills, which have been in, you know, since last year have been in discussion in the state uh, legislature have not moved forward. So those are kinds of things that would help us address some of these issues. Um, I know there's another question here. I will uh, give me one second while I look through. Um, we've already addressed some of the issues about what to do um, with people who are released. Uh, um, so give me a second here. I will let um, Paul, I will unmute you, Paul. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, yes, the question I sent in was a question actually that I asked Governor DeWine last week. Uh, and that is just as a hypothetical and, and I don't, there might be better uh, hypotheticals, but the question was um, with you know, nonviolent, low security, however you, you define that, people that uh, would not appear to create an increased risk of violence or something if they were placed in a, a more favorable situation socially, um, like maybe temporary shelters erected in prison yards with obviously additional guards or so forth, uh, uh, maybe relocation offsite to some sort of building that would be regarded as secure, you know, a warehouse or something. You know, just the idea that uh, appropriate social distancing and, and true separation could be achieved by um, at least temporarily, uh, maybe for a number of months, relocating prisoners. So, um, I mean, if something like that were possible, that uh, that appropriate social distancing and separation could be achieved by relocating prisoners to um, some other temporary facility. Would that be a solution? So yeah, um, I will, I'm gonna to try to share the Indiana document and some other ideas, but I think there are definitely some solutions like that that would be, would be helpful. Um, I don't know, it might be interesting to hear from either Rosie or Kwanzaa or Kevin about how you see, you know, from your knowledge sort of of, from a uh, perspective of a family member, like and a formerly incarcerated in your case, Kevin, like what that might look like and what would be effective and appropriate. Um, so right now there is just a clear lack of space. Uh, prisons themselves, as somebody had mentioned before, you know, people sleep two feet away from each other. So there's a clear overcrowding with lack of space. Um, so in a sense, I don't think there is the space that we could find. If um, 
you know, very rapidly, they could clear out a old warehouse and put a fence around it. Uh, I suppose that would relieve some of the overcrowding. Um, but unfortunately, that, that isn't very plausible right now. Now, a resolution, uh, there are plenty of family members that are ready and willing to accept their family to come home. And so we can just ensure that you know, if, um, and I understand that parole officers might be uh, a bit backed up, but in a sense, if we just make sure that somebody comes home to a proper uh, residence, to an address, we can start sending people home and then do the follow up afterward. Just make sure people come home, make sure, you know, uh, the state knows where they're at, that they're in a healthy environment, and then, um, then we can follow back up. But uh, unfortunately, there just there isn't room, you know. The, yeah. Yeah, full with space as well. So, Kwanzaa, did you have something to add? Yeah, um, I would like to add that that's um, moving the changing the physical building to which with they are confined in is not going to solve the problem. That you're still going to have to employ. Um, guards that will have to have contact with these people. Um, it's highly unlikely that these people will have their own space to sleep in, um, rooms for everyone individually. And then at that point, you're isolating them and quarantining them. Um, how will they go out to eat? Or will they be confined to these rooms to eat? It's just a highly unlikely um, solution to the problem, in my opinion. Okay. Um, you know, also, I'm going to keep trying to post the, um, the thing from Indiana that has some interesting possibilities and options that, that, that I think we could be looking at. Rosie, did you have anything to add? Um, I was just going to say the same thing. This virus we're dealing with okay, is... we have... Go ahead. Go ahead. Can you hear? Yes. Um, I was going to say the same thing. This virus we're dealing with is not normal. You could move them a hundred times, but as Kwanzaa just said, you're still going to have to employ people to come in and possibly bring it right back into the new section. So then you're just keeping moving when there are families that are willing to take them in. They have great support systems. And I just don't understand why we can't do that rather than just keep shipping the problem from place to place. Yeah, thank you. Um, we do have, there's a question I'm gonna, oh, Blythe? Yeah, just to add something really quickly, just to name that in this moment, we are all navigating so much grief and so much transition and change. And we can't know all the advance, all the answers in advance. We just can't know all the answers in advance. And we haven't placed that burden on any other measure that the state is taking. We've closed businesses without understanding the impact of that. We've asked people to stay at home without understanding the impact of that. We've had faith in Ohioans to adapt to the need in front of them. And so far as a state, we've been doing well. And it does not seem right, just, or faithful to place that burden of understanding on those who are incarcerated right now. I have faith as Ohio that we will adapt to the needs um, of the people who are released from prison because the one thing we do understand is that people's proximity to one another is a key point in how this virus is transmitted. So we know that and I trust us to figure out the rest as we go just as we've done all along in this crisis. Thank you, Blythe. Um, Dawn, I'm going to unmute you. You had a follow-up question. Um, yeah, um, I have been in contact with a family member and a friend of two, incar two different incarcerated people who uh, aren't on this call right now. And in both cases, um, the people who are incarcerated were retaliated against because in one case, the incarcerated person had spoken out. And in the other case, the family member has been quite active. Um, they, they're both people who are incarcerated are sick. We don't know if it's COVID-19 or not, um, but they've, they've been retaliated against in their institutions because of the activism taking place. 
Um, is this something you're hearing widespread reports about? Um, I mean, it's incomprehensible to me that, that people would be punished because other people are advocating for them, but is, is this something that's becoming a real problem? Well, um, good question. Thank you. Uh, I, I have yet to follow up with um, my friend Michael Powell, who was at Marion and who sent me some videos um, uh, of the conditions inside and inform me of some of the conditions inside. So um, I have yet to hear from him in the past three days. So uh, I'm going to try to reach out to him or, and other people at the minimum security camp at Marion and make sure that um, nobody is retaliated against because I know that's a very real thing. Thank you. Jason, Aubrey, I've unmuted you. Thank you. I got a bunch of questions for um, a lot of the uh, speakers that uh, we've been talking with that have loved ones in uh, incarceration and also who had uh, been incarcerated themselves in uh, Kevin's case. Uh, I'll start with Kevin. Kevin, can you real briefly just give me a rundown of what exactly happened with you and uh, what you were convicted? Uh, thank you, Jason. I, I saw your post. So I was um, unfortunately caught up in that, you know, quote unquote, uh, street lifestyle. I was convicted of robbing a drug house. Mind you, I was 18. Um, while I was incarcerated, uh, I focused on healing and education. Um, luckily, the, those two things are proven to rehabilitate people, healing and education. And uh, I was afforded the opportunity to be a part of some theater programs, uh, theater and improv, which is such a cathartic experience for people incarcerated and helps people relieve and understand their emotions. Uh, things like philosophy classes and yoga. Like I have seen firsthand tough guys come down, do some yoga and then do some philosophy classes and then all of a sudden have this peace of mind. And then this permeates throughout the whole institution. So those, the, through healing, through art, um, through art therapy, through performance, artistic expression, this is what works and what helps people grow. Excellent, thank you so much. I really appreciate that. Kwanzaa, for you, uh, obviously you may have seen the question as well, but. Can you tell us a little bit more about your father, what he was convicted of, and kind of reflect on, you know, how you're feeling right now uh, from an emotional standpoint uh, that your father could be in prison, get sick, and potentially die from this? Um, yes. As I mentioned before, my father's been convicted of a nonviolent crime, um, although he may deserve to, to serve his sentence. He does not deserve to die while serving a sentence, as I said before. Um, I live in fear every single day, every single night. So not only is he being punished, but because of this COVID-19 virus, I've been punished, my family's been punished. Um, it's almost impossible to um, go on our daily lives with us protecting ourselves and knowing that my father cannot do the same. And I know that one day I was going to be able to see him again and he was going to be with us again. But with this virus, that's I'm sure I'm almost sure that if my father was to contract that virus, he would no longer be with us. And that's frightening. Thank you very much for taking the time to answer. And then Rosie, for you, uh, tell me a little bit more about your husband. What was he convicted of? When was he convicted? And when did he actually go to prison? Um, well, actually, he has a little under a year left to go. Um, oh, this is about saving my husband, really not what he done. He is serving time. He does deserve to be punished. And this is why I said he doesn't deserve a free ride. He can do house arrest. He can do probation or anything like that. It was not a violent crime against anybody else in any way, shape or form. I'm here to save and try to get my husband out. I understand. Thank you very much for clarifying. 
uh, for what you're able to do. And then for all three of you, um, talk a little bit about what it would mean to, for you to have the governor take up what is being asked of him and do this, you know, within the next few days. Well, for me, <clears throat> that would, that's life or death for my dad, first of all. Um, second, um, we all have children. He has a children who has um, 15 children. Um, we have not yet spoken to them about um, where exactly their grandfather is and what's been going on with him. So it, we haven't even passed that yet. So to explain to them that their grandfather has passed away is no longer with us would be heartbreaking and it's more than we could bear. So that is what it would mean for me. All right, I have one last question uh, for, for you guys. And um, I wanna try to word this the correct way and then and that's it for me. I don't have any further questions after that. Um, actually, I do have one follow-up for Kevin. I just noticed that I wrote down. Um, uh, let's just do that now while I contemplate the the wording on this final question for everyone. Kevin, you mentioned that you received some videos uh, from your friend. Uh, is there any chance that you could share those with us today? Um, yes, absolutely. I can. Um, you know what? I can follow up and uh, get those emails or upload them on the chat possibly all right cool. appreciate that yeah we can figure something out uh that last question for everyone is um obviously there's been mention of 205 people that have been um proposed to be released uh i want to ensure that none of your family members or none of the people that you're here advocating for are on that list is that correct no yeah um, I've spoken to my father and um, he has not heard anything about a list or any movement in the facility that he's in at the moment. So, no. Okay, thank you very much. That's all the questions I have. Uh, thank you, Jason. And just to be clear, I, I'm sure you know this, but the uh, recommendations from Governor DeWine for those 205 people are, are simply that. They're recommendations to others, to other officials, judges to consider those people for release. Um, we have a question. Um, also, um, Kevin, if you can't post to the chat those videos, we can we can make sure that people get that afterwards by email. We can send out a link or figure it out. So if it doesn't work on the chat, we can deal with that later. Um, we have a question from Jeremy Pelzer um, about a statement uh, from Bill Faith of Ohio expressing concern about the mass release of inmates um, and the impact on full homeless shelters being overwhelmed with new people. So um, I saw Bill Faith's comment. I think it was probably a bit more nuanced than that. He just said, you know, in some ways very aligned with our position that um, you can't just release people without support. And that's what we've said. That's what Gary said earlier. Um, you need to think about a safe, responsible way to release them. Um, your question suggests that they're people might be safer in prison where they have adequate medical facilities. And one thing that we know pretty clearly, and I see people shaking their heads know that they do not in fact have adequate medical facilities, nor um, the kind of plan that's needed in, in prisons to keep people safe. I mean, if you look at the rapid spread over the past, you know, since was it Friday, a week ago Friday, so a week and a half, not even, it's gone from one tested to to and I don't, the number escapes me at the moment. I said it earlier today. Um, but uh, you, that alone is a clear sign that there's not adequate medical care. They are apparently committing to test uh, every single incarcerated person at five institutions now as of at the end of last week. And that is definitely a step in the right direction, but we have 12 facilities. They're on full lockdown, full, full quarantine. So that clearly is still an inadequate, not an adequate response. Um, even to testing. So I think that what we're advocating for is a, is a safe, you know, we've talked about families that can receive people. We've talked about, I think there are some other options that can be considered, 
um, and making sure that people get the support they need. Obviously, we, we're not advocating for to, to release people into homeless shelters. I've had a conversation with folks in at a shelter um, and they have, at least a week ago, they had not um, had a, um, seen an influx from the releases in Cuyahoga County, for example, where they released 600 people um, over the course of a week or two to really try to reduce the population below capacity and be able to deal with this. It's one of the highlights at the local level. Um, and there was not any corresponding increase in the homeless, homeless population. So I, I'm not sure that question, you know, really has the merit it, it, we might think it does. It's sort of intuitively correct, but I'm not sure that it's really addresses, you know, what we know is that the prisons are not safe right now. And that's the crisis that needs to be addressed. Hey, can I just um, speak to something real quickly? Sure. One of the things as a, as a person of faith, as a minister, uh, one of the things that I sometimes hear, and I'm not saying um, it's present in this particular moment, but one of the things I hear in this fear of, do we have enough resources for folks who are released from incarceration, is this sense of, um, will people who are not incarcerated be denied resources because incarcerated people are, are, are released? Um, and for me, that really strikes uh, at the sense of who is worthy of care and who is unworthy of care and leveraging what, what we um, approach uh, as if is limited resources and uh, that those who are not incarcerated deserve those resources and those who are do not. Uh, and I just wanna say from a faith perspective that all people, people who are incarcerated, people who are not incarcerated are worthy of care and protection in this moment. Uh, and I think that there is a larger abundance um, to meet the needs of this moment than we often look at because we are so stuck in fear um, and because we are um, navigating so much at the same time. So I just want to really push back on um, any kind of uh, indication that people who are incarcerated are unworthy of protection, whether they um, be inside because they were convicted of a violent crime or a nonviolent crime, all people are worthy. Uh, and we need to be acting uh, from that place and that understanding. Thank you so much, Blythe, for that reminder. Um, uh, Bennett, I think you have a follow-up question, Bennett Haberly. Bennett, I've muted you. Oh, thanks. Just just uh, one question was was clarity related. Uh, the people who were uh, who spoke earlier, uh, uh, I appreciate them talking. Uh, who have loved ones who are incarcerated? Were they uh, were were any of those people on the list that the governor put out last week, or are these are these additional individuals that they they'd like released? That question was asked earlier, and, I, and the response from all three, if I'm not incorrect, was that, to their knowledge, the people they know, you know, the family members and loved ones are not on those lists. Okay, thank you. Sorry, I missed that earlier. No worries. Yeah. Oh. Um, and to build on that more and uh, respond upon Bliss' uh, statement that right now, I think DeWine is, is making an exception. Um, but there are so many people who, who we can make an example of how letting people go on judicial releases and et cetera, who are ready to come home will be a benefit to us all. Yeah. If that makes sense. Thank you, Kevin. Um, I do see a question from Andrew Kuyper um, and um, that might be our last question unless there's another burning issue. Um, so he's asking if there have been any confirmation that COVID-19 tests are being administered in the prisons and not at outside medical facilities. So as in, are people being tested in the prisons and not when they're sent to a medical facility with severe symptoms? So if anybody can respond directly to that, that would be great. Um, yes, so again, to my knowledge, they are not being sent to outside med medical facilities and they're only being tested inside the facilities. But then once they're found uh, to have symptoms, they're just being thrown into segregation with no treatment. And so that is the issue. That's what we're, 
we're saying that they should be treated at an outside medical facility to get the proper respiratory treatment that they need to get the proper care because the medical staff just don't have the resources, nor does throwing somebody into uh, an isolated cell um, help anything. It just right away. So, so we would like them to go to facilities because right now it's only there. Okay. Um, I do not see any more questions at this point, and I think we're running, you know, past time already. So I want to respect everyone's time. Um, and if you have follow up, most of you know how to get a hold of at least one of us. Um, please follow up. I see um, Gary is back on, and you know he's certainly. We can share. You know, if anybody has questions, you can just reach out to us, and we will do our best to get back to you as soon as possible. Thank you all, and thank you again, especially to our panelists. Um, everybody who's been on been very helpful, and a, again, a very deep thank you to Rosie, Kwanzaa, and Kevin for sharing your stories. I know that takes a lot of courage and to do that, and this is a very, I can only imagine how stressful this time is for all of you. So uh, thank you for allowing us to put your voices together with ours to, to lift this issue up. Thank you for allowing us to do so. Yes. Thank you all so much. All right. Thank you. Have a good day, everyone. Go ahead. I said thank you until we do this again. Yes. Yeah. Have a good day. Well, hopefully DeWine listens and, and asks judges to start seeing judicial releases. You know, that's I think then hopefully we won't have to be here, you know. Yeah. And thanks to all the journalists who made time to, to ask questions and to listen to us. Bye all.